Welcome back to Law and Crime. Not, my name is Bob Bianchi. There's a lot going on here today. This is really unbelievable. Alec Murdoch's defense team is demanding a new trial for the murder of his wife, Maggie, and son, Paul. Now, I first heard this, and I was like, it's going to be a whole cup of nothing as far as I was concerned. However, the defense claims that the elected clerk of the courts tampered with the jury. That is not a good statement to hear if you're a prosecutor. Murdoch was sentenced to life in prison back in March for the death of his wife and his son. Murdoch's attorneys, Dick Harputlian and Jim Griffin, will be hosting a press conference today as they file a motion requesting a whole new trial in the case. In part, their statement reads, Today we filed a petition based upon newly discovered evidence with the Supreme Court of the of Appeals, South Carolina Court of Appeals, excuse me, to say Alec Murdoch appeal will while a hearing, I'm sorry, is held on a motion for a new trial. These are serious allegations that are filed in this petition, and they themselves could explain a number of peculiarities that occurred in the six-week trial. And they ask that we request SLED stand down on initiating any investigation of these allegations since they are heavily invested maintaining Alex's conviction. Alec Murdoch maintained and still maintains his innocence of the murder and malice of Maggie, rather, and Paul, and he believes the truth will ultimately prevail. I'm so excited, it's just too much to, for me to uh, be able to deal with. This is really serious, folks, because what we're saying here, and I'm reading the paperwork, and we have some great guests that are gonna join us right now, is that this clerk did some extremely and extraordinarily bad things that in my mind could very well necessitate a reversal of the conviction. And not only did they, in their moving papers, write these things, they brought some receipts with regard to affidavits from some of the jurors. So, I mean, if these things pan out to be true at a factual hearing, this prosecution's conviction is in jeopardy. Joining me to discuss the news is criminal defense attorney Chris Adams, along with long crime correspondents Anjanette Levy and Gigi McKelvey. Thank you guys uh, for joining me. I'll start with you. Okay. I'll start with you, Anjanette. Uh, what can you tell us about this like incredible motion and were you struck as I was that they actually have affidavits from jurors here? Hi, Bob. Um, this is the motion. I've been trying to get through the entire thing. It's 65 pages. It includes statements by the defense, also includes affidavits, affidavits and some really uh, startling claims. I am not that surprised, though. I will tell you that because we saw a lot during that trial. It went for six weeks. We heard some things during the trial uh, that could be that could corroborate some of this. And when I say I heard, uh, you know, we were there. We were talking to everybody. It's a small town. People talk. And so I am not that surprised. I'm certainly not surprised that the defense interviewed these jurors, uh, especially the one we called Egg Lady, who was removed from the jury at the very last minute because we knew that the defense uh, was. Uh, really unhappy with that decision. They liked Egg Lady and they thought she was on their side. And that whole thing was very peculiar when it came up. So in this motion, the defense is asserting that Becky Hill, somebody that we dealt with a lot during the trial, uh, that she made up this claim that there was a Facebook post claiming that Egg Lady had said some things about the case and that she believed Alec Murdoch was innocent. Egg Lady is now saying that that never happened, that Becky Hill made it up. Uh, so there's a lot in here. And if this is true, a new trial could possibly be ordered and may very well be ordered. Yeah, I, I, I want to, I mean, I can't, I can just tell you as a trial lawyer how anything that involves interference with a jury's deliberation is a massive problem and what dear has to occur Gigi I, we have affidavits that were submitted by jurors here and you know again it's evidence to a certain extent it hasn't been completely fleshed out but this court uh, clerk Rebecca Hill is her name they argue in these paperwork was telling jurors don't be fooled by the evidence that's being presented by Murdoch's uh, attorneys uh, she directly asked me if I was inclined to vote guilty or not guilty before the deliberations occurred I told her 
that I had not made up my mind and that I want to hear all the evidence before deciding. This is unbelievable pressure. In other parts, she asked if we thought that he was innocent, uh, that basically indicating to them that they, she did not feel that they were innocent, not to be fooled by Murdoch and the way he testifies. I mean, they, they, and, then, and then there's allegations in multiple documents here that she was going into the jury room or the jury area where the jurors were and peeling off a four-person of the jury and going into, uh, you know, multiple conversations for five or ten minutes and telling them not the four-person not to discuss what they're discussing to the other jurors. And on the Facebook piece, I'm sorry to go on with this, but on the Facebook piece that Anjanette just talked about, uh, the judge had indicated when the court clerk, the same court clerk got involved in investigating that, that he had wished she had come to him as opposed to trying to handle it on her own. I mean, that's one thing. But if these statements are true at all, that she was in some way, shape, or form, wink, nod, verbal, or otherwise, telling jurors her viewpoint as to how they should rule, I can't see, in the interest of justice, how this does not, not only get vacated, this conviction, ASAP, but that this court clerk, if true, would not be charged with a crime. Yeah, it's uh, definitely a, a, a huge situation. And I really got concerned after I read the affidavits because that's at the very end of this filing. And it all sort of follows the same pattern of what they are alleging happened. So having, as you said, they came with receipts. I had uh, texted Ann Jeanette to ask if they had put these jurors under oath about this and I hadn't gotten to the end yet. So when I saw those, I thought, oh man, this is a big deal. I mean, this is the biggest trial this, this state has ever seen. And to potentially have this conviction tossed out and do a new trial, it's it's gonna be chaos. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, Anjanette, we try to extend the benefit of the break for the stupidity of human beings, okay, all the time. But this is a court clerk that is trained and sworn to ensure that the jury is fair and impartial and that no one, no one intercedes in the deliberative process. And if that happens, they're to immediately report it to a judge. That's their oath. In this moving papers, in the affidavit, we got piles of papers all over here. I, I, again, I thought it was a big nothing burger until I read this and my, I, my jaw hit the ground. Not only was she basically telegraphing to them not to believe Murdoch, that it's all a trick, the defense is doing a trick, watch him on the stand, there's evidence you don't know about, these are some of the allegations that are in here, but in paragraph 11 of the moving papers of the defendant it said, Ms. Hill, the clerk, then asked about the views of the rest of the jury. She cho told me, if this, this is a juror saying this, if the, the four person would just go in and ask for a raise of hands that it would be done and over with. She said, everyone needs to be on the same page. She then again said she would uh, reinstate a restraining order and we go on about that. So not only is she t giving her viewpoint about the guilt of the defendant, she's actually telling them how to go about it in the deliberative process in order to get there sooner than later. And let's not forget, Anjanette, and maybe you could talk on this, the allegation here is that she didn't want a hung jury. That's why she was trying to figure it out because she had a book deal and wanted to do speaking engagements. Wow, Anjanette. And she did release a book recently, um, just in the last several weeks. So, and she's been on, uh, she was on the new Fox Nation documentary. I saw her interviewed on that over the weekend. So uh, there's a lot going on here. And if, if every word of this is true, this is very serious. It's egregious behavior. And I, I must say, Bob, uh, that during the trial, around the time um, of closing arguments, uh, you know, we were nearing the end of the trial, uh, we had kind of heard, or I had heard really, a rumor that she was talking possibly to the four person. And I was not able to verify that rumor. However, it appears from this paperwork uh, that, sh that, that that was very likely true. Yes, it's a small town, but that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't matter if you pass this person in the hall. You shouldn't be asking her anything except, hey, do you need a bottle of water? Can we get you anything? Uh, do you guys need anything mm -hmm. in there? You know, they, nobody should really be having any contact with the jurors other than the bailiff or whomever is charged with, you know, making sure they get from the courtroom to uh, the jury room and then back to their cars at the end of the day. It's stunning. Yeah, I, I uh, Gigi, let me go through a couple of more things here. And again, 
you can write all you want in, in, in this big fat you know, piece of paper that we have here about the brief, but I segmented the evidence, the actual affidavits that these jurors had submitted. And I, I just want our audience to, to listen to some of, uh, some of this, because, I, I mean, if you can see here, I've got things circled all, you know, all over the place. I'm in complete disbelief from what I'm reading here. Uh, the court clerk supposedly told the juror not to be fooled by the evidence presented by Murdoch's attorneys. Told them not to be fooled by the evidence presented by Murdoch's attorneys which I understand to mean that Murdoch would lie when he testified. End of story. Lights out. If the judge believes that happened, Murdoch's right to a due process has been violated, and it is a sickening and disgusting thing. As a prosecutor, I've been in this position. I have been in a position where, the, not, not, not like with a court clerk, that's unfathomable to me, where there was some allegation of juror tampering, whatever. You have no idea, ladies and gentlemen, how much effort and time and, and sleepless nights and not eating or overeating and not being with your family that prosecutors in particular and defense attorneys too spend on a case like this in order to ensure that there's a fair trial. And you want to make sure that the finger is not put on the scale by anybody. And as a prosecutor, I can tell you in particular, you don't want to put a victim's family through it. Your witnesses through a second trial for something you had absolutely no control over, i.e. somebody tampering with a, uh, with a juror. And guys, uh, Gigi in particular, she, the clerk, clerk is alleged to have said in this affidavit, watch him, referring Murdoch closely, which I understood to mean he was guilty. I mean, this is just unbelievable. Immediately testified, uh, let's go further. She told the jury, we cannot interact with Mr. Murdoch because that is what the defense wants us to do. Um, basically saying the verdict shouldn't take you too long. I'm just going through some of these other ones. You're going to, right before the defense put up the case, Ms. Hill told jurors, y'all are going to hear things that will throw you off. Don't. Let this distract or mislead you. I am so outraged by this. If these allegations are true, I don't even I don't even know what to say other than if the judge does his voir dire and does his interrogation, which he did with the Facebook issue with regard to her, and she did a hum and a hum and that turned out to be all false, all falsely created, but it got a juror thrown off the case. I gotta tell you what, if I were representing Miss Hill, I'd tell her to take the fifth before she spoke to the judge. Yeah, I think she's definitely probably not feeling so hot right now. I think that these receipts, I mean, it's, I, I really thought like you, this was going to be a nothing burger, that this was just throw something against the wall and see if it sticks. We know that the defense was not happy. She wrote the book and went on the, the press tour shortly after I, I interviewed her on my podcast. I know you guys interviewed her. And um, so I, I just don't know where this is going to go. But like you, I do think that this could end up in, in a brand new trial for him and we got to do this again. It was six weeks in Walterboro. My question is, at this point, do you move it out of Walterboro? And is there going to be another judge presiding since Judge Newman has subsequently given interviews on air since the verdict? This could be a big logistical nightmare for a million reasons. Yeah, well, this lady may have been doing this for her own personal self-gain. We'll see with the facts. It's only an allegation right now. We don't know. Or she may have been doing it because she was on, top, uh, on uh, the USA, pro-police, pro pro-prosecution. And if that's true, she has no idea the stake she put through the prosecutor's hearts right now who are sitting there in disbelief that all their effort, all their time. I mean, I don't even know what the prosecutors are going to say here because usually you'd say, well, whatever taint happened with the jury, it would not have affected the outcome of the case. I have never, in over 30 years of a career, seen anything as complicitous and duplicitous as this. And I am sure the prosecutors' hearts are breaking that they even have to respond to this. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Law and Crime. Uh, guys, you got to be watching this. We'll, we're going to be handling this. There's going to be a press conference that's going to be going on with regard to this Alec Murdoch development. Uh, this is really, I mean, I've been doing this a long time. I, I am really awestruck, jaw dropping in all the years I've done this, never heard anything quite like this. In case you're just joining us, the defense team for Alex Murdoch is asking for a new trial for their client who's currently serving a life sentence for killing his wife and son. Dick Harputlian and Jim Griffin claim that evidence has come to light since their client's conviction and are requesting a whole new trial. There'll be a press conference regarding this motion at, uh, I believe, around 2.30. Now, now like we've been saying, you've been watching the previous segments when I first heard this and the producer said, oh, you may have to talk about this. And I said, big zero, motion for a new trial, newly discovered evidence, been there, done that, happens every day. Then I got the moving papers, read the brief, and then the attached receipts, the affidavits from these jurors. I was blown away. Prediction, this case is being reversed and the court clerk in that particular courtroom Better not be talking to anybody. If I were her lawyer, I'd be telling her to exercise her right to remain silent. Law and crime correspondent Anjanette Levy is here uh, with me right now. And while we wait for the press conference to begin, she has some of the defense motion worth her to read for us. Anjanette, I mean, are you wowed like me here or what? Is it just me? I'm, I'm, I can't believe it. Well, the extent of the allegations is somewhat surprising, Bob, but I, I'm not completely surprised by this because we had heard some rumblings and Egg Lady, as I mentioned, the one juror that we believed would be, you know, seemed to believe Alec Murdoch, um, you know, she was removed from the jury and it was pretty controversial. It came at the end of the trial and we had heard some rumblings about whether or not all of this was true, about her discussing the case with her ex-husband or what have you. So I am going through it and I'm reading the affidavit of one of the jurors. Um, I'm not going to put her name out there, but she said several times during the trial, Miss Hill told the jurors that the media would want to interview jurors at the end of the trial. And during one of these conversations, she passed out business cards from the media to jurors. At the end of the trial, Ms. Hill told, redacted name, that no one from the media wanted to interview her. Right before the defense put up their case, this is the next bullet point, Ms. Hill told the jurors, quote, y'all are going to hear things that will throw y'all off. Don't let this distract you or mislead you. Number seven, this next point, after Alex testified, eight jurors indicated they did not believe his testimony. Point number eight, Redacted name, recalled that redacted name, juror 544, known as Boston by many of the jurors, was very emotional during the trial. Number nine, during the visit to Moselle, redacted name, juror 826, and redacted name, walked to the scene together. Then juror 826 began walking with the clerk of court, Becky Hill. There were times the jurors were not kept together, but were in two separate rooms. Redacted name noticed that jurors talking about the case before deliberations began. Neither she nor redacted name, juror number 785, joined in on the conversations about Alec. As the jury was deliberating, she believes Judge Newman came to the room she was in and told her the jury would have to spend the night at a hotel if they did not have a vote by a certain time, but she does not recall the time or the deadline. Redacted name, juror number 741, was the first former juror to provide information that the clerk of court made statements to members of the jury about the evidence presented during the trial prior to the jury deliberations. Ms. Hill's conduct was corroborated by other jurors during subsequent interviews. And I must say, earlier on in this affidavit, Bob, uh, it says that um, during the trial, uh, she witnessed clerk of court Becky Hill come to the jury room and Ms. Hill and the four person uh, juror number 826, whose name is redacted, went into the bathroom. After Ms. Hill and the four-person exited the bathroom, Ms. Hill told the jurors they could not ask the four-person questions. Uh, there's also an allegation being made in here, Bob, that somehow Becky Hill selected the four-person of the jury, or at least recommended uh, that the four-person who, who the, recommended the judge pick a certain juror as a four person. So I know specifically I can see her in my mind right now, the four person on the jury. She was not the original uh, four person, if memory serves me correctly. Uh, and we had a number of jurors dropped or replaced during this trial. So these are very, very serious allegations. 
and Becky Hill may be required, there may be an evidentiary hearing about this, and she may be required to testify. And as you said earlier, she may invoke her Fifth Amendment right. <laughs> well, I'm telling her she came to the law firm of the Bianchi Law Group. That's exactly what we'd be saying. We have Chris Adams with us, criminal defense lawyer. Chris, in addition to that excellent presentation uh, that you just heard, I'm going to paragraph 10. Now, this Facebook thing, we're going to have to drill down a little bit more. Maybe you can explain the ins and outs about how that got that four person essentially thrown off the jury and it turned out to be a fraud about her ex husband who she hadn't seen in 10 years. Blah, blah, blah. We can go through all that. But in one of the affidavits, Miss, is, it's alleged that she, uh, Chris, that she was going into the jury room. She was having private conversations with people. She was influencing them with regard to uh, basically Murdoch's a liar. Don't believe his defense attorneys. But paragraph ten of one of the affidavits indicates Miss Hell then asked me questions about my opinion regarding Murdoch's guilt. Chris. Chris, you're a great trial lawyer. Can you even believe that I'm reading these words if they're even true prior to the, th they're asking whether or not she, uh, the opinion of the juror on Murdoch's guilt. She asked if I was leaning one way or the other. Come on. I told her Creighton Waters closing was good, but I still had questions. She asked me what kind of questions and I replied questions about the guns. She asked me what would make me think he's innocent? I, I just, I, I asked, there was no murder weapon found. She then asked, well, what makes you think he's guilty? I said, Paul's video. It just is an extensive discussion of the facts. She then stated everything Murdoch said has been lies and that I should, quote, forget the guns, they will never be seen again. Uh, Chris, are you in complete shock like I am? I, I, it's almost impossible to believe it, except you have these affidavits coming from multiple pe multiple jurors that are all essentially cooperating this. If, if the allegations are true, it is outrageous, outrageous conduct that should require a new trial. Uh, this, this kind of stuff just can't be allowed in courts, big trials or small trials. And, we know that there's some informality in some smaller courthouses or maybe informality in some chambers, but this is so far beyond that. This is a, a clerk of court. If these allegations are true, it's a clerk of court coaching the jurors to return a guilty verdict, which we just can't allow that. Yeah. Uh, wow. Um, I got to tell you, Chris, I, I was saying before, I, I think the prosecutors are devastated by this. When I've had any kind of issues with juror involvement, which don't even approach anything like this, you have a voir dire. Right. You Here, why don't you let him Wait a minute, what are they facing? Is it like this? Okay. Is that good? All right. Okay, so. Supposed to button your jacket. Yeah, but. Yeah, button your What? Supposed to button my jacket. Yeah. So I'm going to read a statement. Jim Griffin will have a couple words to say, and then we'll answer questions. Today, Jim Griffin and I filed a petition based on newly discovered evidence with the South Carolina Court of Appeals to stay Alec Murdaugh's appeal while a hearing is held on a motion for a new trial. Concurrently, we've sent a request to the South Carolina U.S. Attorney to open a federal investigation into the violation of Alec Murdaugh's civil rights. The allegations in the petition filed today speak for themselves, but we believe they explain a number of peculiarities in the six-week trial. We request that SWED stand down on initiating any investigation of these allegations since they are heavily invested in maintaining Alex's convictions. We suggest they wait for the Court of Appeals to rule and receive direction from the trial court. If the Court of Appeals remands the case for an evidentiary hearing, if the, if the Court of Appeals remands the case for an evidentiary hearing, we would also request that those in the media and the public respect the privacy of those included in this filing. Jim and I want to thank those on our team who stand behind us and, and have worked tirelessly to ferret out the truth. Alex Murdoch maintains, maintained and still maintains his innocence in the murder of Maggie and Paul and believes the truth will ultimately prevail. Jim. The right to a jury trial, Stand over here. the right to a jury trial is a fundamental principle of our justice system. Jurors must be free from outside influences and must decide the case solely on the evidence 
presented in the courtroom subject to the rules of evidence, subject to the rules of the court, and most importantly, subject to the crucible of cross-examination that's guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution, and that is the right to confront witnesses. When, when a jurors are receive private communications outside the confines of a public courtroom, the Sixth Amendment is violated and numerous other constitutional rights are violated. And that's not Jim Griffin on the law, that is the law of the land. And I want to quote from a decision from the South Carolina Court of Appeals, which is behind me, and states this, where there is a private communication of a court official to members of the jury, an occurrence which cannot be tolerated if the sanctity of the jury system is to be maintained. A new trial must be granted unless it clearly appears that the subject matter of the communication was harmless and could not have affected the verdict. What we had filed today, it, it, supported by sworn testimony of jurors, is that the clerk of court had improper private communications with the jurors and the subject matter, the subject matter of those communications was the credibility of the defense that the Murdoch legal defense team put up and it was the believability of the defendant's own testimony. Now, there's been a lot of said, talked about whether Alex should have taken the stand. I can assure you, I can assure you, when we considered what factors and what we should and should not do and considered whether he should take the stand, we never considered the likelihood, as reported to us by the jurors, that the clerk of court would go in to the sanctity of the jury room before he testified and tell the jurors, don't be fooled by his testimony, watch out for his body language, and, and that is what the sworn testimony that we have filed in court today says. And if that is true, which we have every reason to believe that it is, and no reason to believe that it's not, there is no choice but the courts to grant a new trial. Thank you. Any questions? No? No. Okay. Well, I think we observed it. But we we did. There. No, I was there. Oh yeah, you're yeah, right. yeah. Um, I was there. I watched it. But I mean, look, we're we were not looking to impute any nefarious conduct. Uh, but clearly, what the what the jurors reported to us that they were off talking, the four lady and the clerk. Um, I saw them together, but you know, I wasn't watching. I believe. Look, I've been doing this almost 50 years. The bedrock of any trial, and I've done hundreds of them, is that the clerk of court is the the person that makes sure the jury gets their food. It's if, if they're put up for the night, some place to stay. Their travel accommodations are, are, are met. They're not someone that ever should talk to them about the case. I've never had it happen. Again, I've been doing this for a very long time. Never heard of it happening until this case. And one, one, one thing we want everyone to understand that the clerk of court is an elected official by the people, not appointed by the judge, not appointed by the judiciary. It's a public official who's elected and is an independent state actor. And so that what we are complaining about in the motion that we filed today is the conduct of an elected official, not conduct by Judge Newman or anybody in the unified court system. And, and I think it's important also to understand that she is a state actor and that's why we forwarded today a letter to the U.S. Attorney asking them to open an investigation into the violation of Alec Murdoch's civil rights by a state actor under, under color of state law. I believe you guys had four jurors that, that you had affidavits for in the paperwork you filed. Did they reach out to you or did you guys reach out to them? Well, <laughs> this is an interesting story. Let Jim tell you. So immediately in the aftermath of the verdict, we um, had received information that that we needed to look into what happened in the jury room. Um, we uh, started down that road and and we met a zone of silence. No jurors would speak to us. And so we were, you know, what I like to call we were given the Heisman, right? And then when the clerk of court wrote her book, published her book, that zone of silence collapsed and jurors were upset about that, the ones we talked with, 
and they were more than willing to come forward and tell us the things <clears throat> that that we had sort of heard through a whisper campaign but and, and so as a result of that we were able to interview some jurors now there's still a number of jurors who maintain that zone of silence who have not talked to us we did try to reach out to most all of them that we could get in touch with but we you know the information we got I can tell you was independent of each juror the first juror we talked to we got information about Miss Hill saying don't be fooled and and then the second juror independent of the first juror says the same thing and the third juror independent of the other two say the same thing and so we're very confident that the information is accurate well and, and, and it, what, what ask them I mean, that's, we don't have any control over that. We just did receive a notice from the Court of Appeals that the Attorney General has 10 days to respond to our motion. Okay. okay? Now, I think what's interesting to me, again, having done this for so long, is that we, once we had that initial contact with that first juror, uh, we began going around. We had a list and knocking on, literally on Sundays, knocking on jurors' doors, asking them to speak with us. Some of them wouldn't come out. Some of us told us never to come back. Um, but but some did, and some talked to us. Um, I'll give you an example. And uh, one of the things we heard was once the jury went out, um, even though there were six smokers and they were given smoke breaks during the entire trial, once the jury went out, they were told no more smoke breaks. No, you're not you people that want nicotine. You're going to have to get a verdict first. I mean, it's that kind of stuff. Now that indicates something and the court would be the one to communicate that what why so uh, a, a bunch of folks told us stuff that appeared to be um, inconsequential but in the total context indicated to us uh, that, that what we've put in this petition about the court uh, is credible um, and based on sworn testimony from two jurors um, and we interviewed a third uh, uh, my paralegal Holly Miller has given you an affidavit or filed an affidavit on what she told us. A lot of these folks just don't want to get involved, but they're going to be involved if we get a hearing because each and every one of them is going to have to testify in an open court before you as to what happened and what didn't happen. Wait, one at a time. Who? Well, and that's a good point. There's no suggestion that the, the, that the judge did anything untoward. But what that does do, if it comes back, he may end up being a witness. Um, so, I mean, it's, but until the Court of Appeals acts, that issue does not have to be dealt with. But if, if the fact is that the court was aware of some of these issues but still didn't intervene, how concerned are you? We don't know. We, we don't know that he didn't intervene. That's why I'm saying he's a witness. We need to know. You know, that's, that's not the legal test. The legal test is, is the subject matter prejudicial to the defense. It's not would, would it have made a difference in the outcome. Was the subject matter of the improper private conversation material to the defense? If it's immaterial, like, like what do you want to have for dinner? Um, you know, do you want to take a smoke break? Do you want to go home? Those are immaterial matters. But when the subject matter is and is reported under oath by these jurors, it was a direction on how you should receive Alec Murdoch's testimony. You should look at him. Don't be fooled by him. That subject matter is absolutely material. That's the core of our defense, and that is something that we had no chance to defend against. And so we strongly believe if that evidence is accurate and the law will require a new trial. If this when is was all the last true, do you think the clerk should client? be criminally charged? When was the last time no you comment. Your comment? Well, I can't talk about attorney-client privilege information. I can tell you that, that when I shared with him the affidavits, he's a lawyer, he was astonished, he was shaking, he, he was in disbelief, and he thanked Mr. Harpoolian, Mr. Barber, and myself for spending our weekends on dirt roads in Colleton County. And by the way, we've seen more of Colleton County <laughs> on dirt roads um, in places we didn't, we're city boys, we didn't believe existed in this state, um, looking for folks that would talk to us. A lot of doors slammed in our face. 
a lot of doors slammed in our faces. I'm sorry? No comment. I'm sorry, what? The Facebook posting from the ex-husband of the Smith drawer. There's a lot of detail in there about that. And there's some in-camera transcripts up there as well. But was this not something that you know, happened very quickly? I mean, the fact that he swears or alleged it didn't exist at all and perhaps was conspired to be created to get this drawer dismissed? Yes. I mean, that's a very serious allegation. It's all serious. Everything we've alleged, everything in those affidavits is serious. This is a very serious matter. Um, and again, um, so what, what, what you see in the sworn testimony that's in file, been filed today is Ms. Hill told the court that there was a Facebook post by this juror's ex-husband. The ex-husband has filed an affidavit saying, I've never posted a Facebook post. Ms. Hill and her, and her uh, office says he must have deleted it we can't find it but they produced an a Facebook post from someone with the same name apologizing for an earlier Facebook post and that Satan made him do it and I and etc cetera, etc cetera. and Miss Hill related that as being this juror's ex-husband Miss Hill had this juror's ex-husband's photograph you can match them up they don't match and what we do know and, and we laid it out in detail in our in our brief is that the apology Facebook post was posted, I think, on February 16th and said we had deleted it the day before, February 15th. Ms. Hill is telling Judge Newman on February 23rd that I just saw this Facebook post. Impossible, impossible. We also have in there sworn testimony that Ms. Hill told this juror that SLED went out and confirmed with your ex-husband that he posted that. Not true, according to the sworn testimony. And and and. Uh, Phil Barber and and I and Holly Miller from my office went down and interviewed the ex-husband and he allowed us to, I wouldn't know how to do it, but Phil did, to download his entire Facebook history. None of that is in there. So, I mean, again, we've done what we can do. We're not the police. You know, we, we have no way to compel anybody to talk to us or give us anything. We've asked very nicely. Now, I will say this. The two jurors that gave affidavits have an attorney. Joe McCullough, who was skulking around here a moment ago back there. So if you want to know about those two jurors, you may want to have a chat with him. What's the, the, motiv what's the motivation the of the jurors to talk to you? Wait, what? What's the motivation, do you think, of the jurors talking to you? Are they upset with the clerk? I think they were upset with the way things went. And the, the clerk, I think they may very well. Well, yes, they're upset with the clerk. They're upset with the way this played out. Are they regretting their, their vote? Can't comment on that. In the Facebook post, the person who posted the original post, have you ever gotten an opportunity to speak with them? And if so, no, no. I mean, we well, the original post, we don't know whether it ever existed. But, um, but the apology post, did you speak with him, Phil? No, did we speak with no, him? no, no, we did not speak. Do you have a timeline from the FBI regarding your request for a new investigation? Well, as you know, having talked to the FBI before, no, <laughs> they're not going to tell us anything. In your letter to the U.S. Attorney, you mentioned the importance. Well, having anybody but SLED investigated. SLED is very invested in this conviction. How invested? Well, uh, the agent, David Owens, that testified under cross-examination by Jim admitted two things. One, he perjured himself in front of the grand jury. And two, he fabricated evidence. SLED made him this year's Law Enforcement Officer of the Year. So is that the agency that ought to be going to jurors? I don't think so. I think that um, the, the court, whenever if this is remanded back, the trial court should pick somebody else. If the FBI is not doing it, then there are plenty. There's the sheriff's departments. There are other folks, not Collison County, but other sheriff's departments that they could go out and interview jurors or bring them to court. I mean, all these jurors are going to end up testifying anyway. There may not be any reason to go out and interview them. They may just bring, put a subpoena on them, bring them to court. Yeah, I mean, that's something that that, that would happen if we get the hearing that we've requested. That's why we've requested the hearing, so that we can get subpoena power and we, we can get some subpoena, not just individuals come to court, jurors come to court, witnesses come to court, but subpoena records, phone records, for example, uh, emails, for example. I mean, so with a hearing, 
we have a broad array of uh, assets at our disposal to, to bring evidence to court. Right now, we've got nothing except Dick's Mercedes and uh, dirt roads in Collin County. Have you ever heard any jurors who refuse what the other jurors are saying? No, we've not had any juror contradict anything what the other jurors are saying. What, what you, Jen, what, what you saw in, our, in, in some of the affidavits is um, the, the jurors were separated in two rooms and sort of broke up from, you know, guys in, in one room, gals in another room, I don't know if that was appropriate, men in one room, <laughs> females in another room, and, and so the, the comments that, that we've, we've gotten on the sworn affidavits come from the ladies' room, if you will, more so than the men's room, but we, you know, we, we do have information that we've submitted from one juror where he, he does acknowledge that she talked to him about evidence about autopsy photos and don't be upset about them. I mean, that should not be happening. That should not be happening. And, and, and this juror is a smoker and, you know, he relayed to us basically the coercive effect of people who have a nicotine habit not able to um, smoke. Until they reach a verdict. Until they reach a verdict. And yeah. so that's what we got. There's wait, wait, wait a second. Yeah. I have an issue with the cable. The very, could you read that? There is a judicial motion to repeal. Do what now? The motion you read. Can you read that? Very first thing. I, yeah, I mean, I'll read it for you after we get done with this, but I, I don't, I don't think I ought to keep all these folks doing that. Well, you got to, you got to get a new trial before you get there, and that's, that's not something we're going to talk about today. And, yes, ma'am. We don't. We, well, we know we know some of the statements were made in front of the jurors in the one jury room. Now, understand that's I think there are only six jurors in that room, um, or maybe eight. I'm not sure, but but um, not all the jurors would have been present for all the statements. Clearly, they were given in one room or the other. Yes, ma'am. So, yeah, so, so, so we have not, we didn't stop investigating, but, but we were hitting brick walls until her book came out. And, and then jurors who obviously were not comfortable with how she handled matters were even less comfortable with her going on a book tour and making money off what she did. That, that's what was reported to us. Now she has said her book is self-published. Well, she's trying to make a lot of money. That's the point. I mean, she did. She's trying to make money off of it. She's selling the book. I mean, the question is, was it a successful scheme? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it what? If you've read it, I'm not going to give a book review here, but I don't know that you buy the book. I mean, it's not well written. The story they t she tells is not accurate, um, in in our opinion, at least the the, the facts as we saw them. What did you think about the passage of her book that describes going to Moselle with the jurors? Well, you know, the, the, the problem I have with the, what she says in there is, after going to Moselle, Moselle, we, if you notice, she used the plural we, felt such and such and such and such. Is that the jurors in her? I mean, I think that's great cross-examination for her when she testifies in this matter before the trial judge, if the court of appeal sends it back. Absolutely. Absolutely. When all y'all there, we miss you. Any other questions? Yeah, you said you're investigating. So along your investigations into the alleged jury misconduct and these allegations, have you uncovered any additional things that you would present in a second trial for your defense? Mm, let's not talk about that. Yeah, no. If we are lucky enough to get a second trial, uh, you have to wait and see. You know, we're not we're not going to disclose any of that today. What, what is your optimism for getting for, for this motion? I am uh, I'm very optimistic that ultimately we will get a new trial. How long that'll take, I don't know. Have you tried to reach Clerkville after any questions about any of this? 
we uh, we've not reached out to Clark Hill. We had reached out to some other folks, and um, and based on the information we received, uh, we thought it would be pointless to reach out to her. What now? We're focused on getting him a new trial. That's what we've been working on. Anything else? No? Thank you so much. You, Let me give this, read this statement yeah. to him real quick. Sure, sure. Gun. No shit. Hill is telling Judge Newman on February 23rd that I just saw this Facebook post. Impossible. Impossible. We also have in there sworn testimony that Ms. Hill told this juror that SLED went out and confirmed with your ex-husband that he posted that. Not true according to the sworn testimony. And 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 uh, Phil Barber and, and I and Howie Miller from my office went down and interviewed the ex-husband and he allowed us to I wouldn't know how to do it, but Phil did, to download his entire Facebook history. None of that is in there. So, I mean, again, we've done what we can do. We're not the police. You know, we've, we have no way to compel anybody to talk to us or give us anything. We've asked very nicely. Now, I will say this. The two jurors that gave affidavits have an attorney, Joe McCullough, who was skulking around here a moment ago back there. So if you want to know about those two jurors, you may want to have a chat with him. So what's, what's, the the what's the motivation the of the jurors wait, talking to you? Wait, what? What's the motivation, do you think, of the jurors talking to you? Are they upset uh, with the clerk? I think they were upset with the way things went. And the, the clerk, I think they may very well. Well, yes, they're upset with the clerk. They're upset with the way this played out. Are they regretting their, their vote? Can't comment on that. In the Facebook post, the person who posted the original post, have you ever gotten an opportunity to speak with them? And if so, No. No, I mean, we, well, the original post, we don't know whether it ever existed. But, um, but the apology post, did you speak with him, Phil? No. Did we speak with no, him? No, no, we did not speak. Do you have a timeline from the FBI regarding your request for a new investigation? Well, as you know, having talked to the FBI before, no. <laughs> They're not going to tell us anything. In your letter to the U.S. Attorney, you mentioned the importance of having the FBI investigate as opposed to SLED, for example. Can you talk about the importance of having the FBI get involved? Well, having anybody but SLED investigate it. SLED is very invested in this conviction. How invested? Well, uh, the agent, David Owens, who testified under cross-examination by Jim, admitted two things. One, 
he perjured himself in front of the grand jury, and two, he fabricated evidence. Swed made him this year's Law Enforcement Officer of the Year. So is that the agency that ought to be going to jurors? I don't think so. I think that um, the, the court, whenever if this is remanded back, the trial court should pick somebody else. If the FBI is not doing it, then there are plenty. There's the sheriff's departments. There are other folks, not Colleton County, but other sheriff's departments that they could go out and interview jurors or bring them to court. I mean, all these jurors are going to end up testifying anyway. There may not be any reason to go out and interview them. They may just bring, put a subpoena on them, bring them to court. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that's something that, that that would happen if we get the hearing that we've requested. That's why we've requested the hearing, so that we can get subpoena power and we, we can get some subpoena, not just individuals come to court, jurors come to court, witnesses come to court, but subpoena records, phone records, for example, uh, emails, for example. I mean, so with a hearing, we have a broad array of uh, assets at our disposal to, to bring evidence to court. Right now, we've got nothing except Dick's Mercedes and uh, dirt roads in Collin County. Have you ever had any jurors who refused what the other jurors were saying? No, we've not had any juror contradict anything what the other jurors are saying. What what you, Jen, what, what you saw in our in, in some of the affidavits is um, the, the jurors were separated in two rooms and sort of broke up from, you know, guys in, in one room, gals in another room. I don't know if that was appropriate. Men in one room, <laughs> females in another room, and and so the the comments that that we've we've gotten on the sworn affidavits come from the ladies' room, if you will, more so than the men's room. But we you know we we do have information that we've submitted from one juror where he he does acknowledge that she talked to him about evidence, about autopsy photos, and don't be upset about them. I mean that should not be happening. That should not be happening. And, and this juror is a smoker, and you know he relayed to us basically the coercive effect of people who have a nicotine habit not able to um, smoke until they reach a verdict. Until they reach a verdict, and yeah. so that's what we got. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait a second. Yeah. I had an issue with the cable at the very. Can you read that the initial motion for a fast? You had an issue with sending. Do what now? The, the, the motion you read. Can you read that? Very first thing. I yeah, I mean, I'll read it for you after we get done with this, but I, I don't, I don't think I ought to keep if all these folks doing this. Would you request a change of venue? Well, you got to, you got to get a new trial before you get there, and that's, that's not something we're going to talk about today. And, yes, ma'am. We don't. We, well, we know we know some of the statements were made in front of the jurors in the one jury room. Now, understand that's I think there are only six jurors in that room, um, or maybe eight. I'm not sure, but but um, not all the jurors would have been present for all the statements. Clearly, they were given in one room or the other. Yes, ma'am. So, yeah, so, so, so we have not, we didn't stop investigating, but, but we were hitting brick walls until her book came out. And, and then jurors who obviously were not comfortable with how she handled matters were even less comfortable with her going on a book tour and making money off what she did. That, that's what was reported to us. Now, she has said her book is self-published. That really doesn't sound like somebody who's getting a lot of money. What do you say to that if somebody says, well, she's just self-published? Well, she's trying to make a lot of money. That's so the point. I mean, she did. She's trying to make money off of it. She's selling the book. I mean, the question is, was it a successful scheme? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, what if you've read it, I'm not going to give a book review here, but I don't know that you buy the book. I mean, it's not well written the story they t she tells is not accurate um, in in our opinion at least the, the, the facts as we saw them what did you think about the passage of her book that describes going to Moselle with the jurors well you know the the, the problem I have with the, the, what she says in there is after going to Moselle Moselle we 
if you notice, she used the plural we felt such and such and such and such. Is that the jurors in her? I mean, I think that's great cross-examination for her when she testifies in this matter before the trial judge, if the Court of Appeals sends it back. Do you want any hearing in this matter to be public? Absolutely. Absolutely. When all y'all there, we miss you. Any other questions? Yeah, you said you're investigating. So along your investigations into the alleged jury misconduct and these allegations, have you uncovered any additional things that you would present in a second trial for your defense? Mm, let's not talk about that. Yeah, no. If we are lucky enough to get a second trial, uh, you have to wait and see. You know, we're not we're not going to disclose any of that today. What, what is your optimism for getting for, for this motion? I am uh, I'm very optimistic that ultimately we will get a new trial. How long that'll take, I don't know. Have you tried to reach Clerk Mill, ask for any questions about any of this? We, uh, we've not reached out to Clark Hill. We had reached out to some other folks. And, um, and based on the information we received, uh, we thought it would be pointless to reach out to her. Do you have any alternate suspect or suspects? What now? Do you have any alternate suspect or suspect in case? We're focused on getting him a new trial. That's what we've been working on. Anything else? No? Thank you so much. Thank you, Let me give this read this statement yeah. to him real quick. Sure, sure. John, how did No shit. Wow. Uh, okay, I got two main questions. Let's start with, you know, uh, Anjanette and Gigi. You guys, I think, know this clerk, Rebecca Hill. You, you alluded to that before. Can Look, this is if these allegations are true, it's a really bad thing. Is this a nefarious person? I, I, I'm, I, like, what is she like? Is this something that you can see her doing, or was it just sheer stupidity? I, I know Gigi, Becky. I think you should take that one. <laughs> yeah, I know Becky well, and I do not think that this was. Um, targeted or nefarious on her part. She is a very sweet person. And I think one thing to consider, even though it doesn't excuse it, is this is a small town. And in the South, everybody knows everybody, especially in towns of this size. I think if this did happen, I don't think that she really had any ill intent. But at the same time, I do see the point of the defense attorneys. You have jurors here given sworn affidavits saying that this happened. But as a person, you could not meet a sweeter soul than Becky Hill. So I mm. hope that this resolves. And man, it's just a mess. You it's know, such a mess. But, it, but let me push back on that a little bit, Gigi, because like we used to say in the business when we would interview somebody on a murder case, hey, good people do bad things. Good people do right. bad things. And what I, I'd like to ask you about is you brought two things up. Small town. I heard in that press conference she's an elected official. That always gets me nervous. If anybody ever watches me, they know I'm all about the appointment process where you have a term of office so you can't be influenced by the court of public opinion or the small hometown viewpoint. But you can't tell me, Gigi, I mean, I'm not saying you're telling me, but one can't tell me that a court clerk does not know that going into a jury room and telling them how to view the testimony of a defendant and the defense team is not wrong. I, it just so she may be a, a sweet, beautiful human being, but she she's not stupid, right? I don't think so. Um, but these papers are definitely pointing that this could have happened. So I'm very interested to see what comes of this. But just as a person, the person I know, very kind hearted. And um, man, I, you know, there's a part of me that actually feels a little bad for her right now, just because I know her. But at the same time, this this is a mess. This was the biggest trial this state's ever seen. One of the biggest in the country in a very long time. And to think that we have to redo this, it is just a nightmare. So we'll see what happens. Before I pepper Chris with a couple of legal questions, and Jeanette, do you have anything to, that you'd like to opine with regard to your viewpoint of the clerk or her personality, her mentality, or what she did here from a personal point of view? Well, Gigi certainly spent more time uh, with her because Gigi was down there longer than I was. Um, but my limited interactions with Becky Hills, she she was polite to me. Um, but 
we had heard some things. I mean, I had heard some things while I was down there, some rumblings. And I said earlier I couldn't confirm those things at the time, but some of those rumblings are included in this motion that she was having conversations with the foreperson. Uh, so people do things for different reasons. If, if this stuff is true, uh, you know, and I'm giving her the benefit of the doubt, um, it's, it's wrong. And I don't know why she would have done this if it's true. Well, I mean, if it's true, we can always go back to the same old adage that keeps us all employed, Doc, uh, lawyers, uh, prosecutors, judges, you know, all of us on TV networks, uh, Chris, his pride becomes, uh, comes before the fall, um, maybe wanted a name for herself or whatever it may be because there is an indication in this moving papers that she was concerned because she wanted to write that book that she didn't want to be a mistrial, telling jurors they can't smoke, telling jurors that if they don't have a verdict by 11 o'clock, they're going to have to stay in a hotel when they weren't prepared to do that, all seems like a lot of pressure tactics to me but Chris what I'd like to ask you is okay here we go uh, everyone in the collective world is now blown up the prosecutors are freaking out the judge is just getting this landed on the desk the defense knew about this for a while uh, so they're somewhat prepared what does a judge do with regard to the process of going forward with a voir dire of these jurors and do the jurors have to answer the judge's questions so it's in an interesting situation because the case is up on appeal at the South Carolina Court of Appeals. So the first step would be for the South Carolina Court of Appeals to deal with the emergency request to remand the case back to the trial court. They have the authority to do that. It seems like it would be an appropriate step to take. I anticipate that they will send the case back for this matter to be dealt with and for a full record to be made at the trial court. Then the question becomes, who's going to preside um, the ordinarily the trial judge would preside mr hartputlian at the press conference made some indication that judge newman might have information that would either make him a witness or that would not allow him to sit neutrally over the evidence in particular the facebook post and and the investigation done by allegedly done by ms hill so it they would have to determine who's gonna sit. Is it Judge Newman's case or will they bring in another judge? At that point, there would likely be a hearing with whoever the judge is going to be and you would get jurors who are called in. It would be quite a spectacle. Um, Ms. Hill would be subpoenaed. Um, she is likely going to have a lawyer by then and, and I would, think may very well follow the lawyer's advice so she may not testify and then you would hear from however many jurors this bob is a, a long answer in a situation where you have external pressures on the jury especially from an elected official or a court sanctioned employee there's a presumption of prejudice mm. so a lot of times there are things that are irregular in a trial and the conviction is affirmed because there's a presumption that it happened correctly or that the error was mm -hmm. somehow minor or harmless. Mm -hmm. In this situation, if if these affidavits are proven in court, there should be a presumption of prejudice, then the attorney general's office would have to try to make the showing, if they can, that there's no way that these influences impacted the outcome of the verdict. They might not. They might say, if this stuff is true, Judge, if you find this is true and the presumption applies, then he's entitled to a new trial out of fairness. It's not probably going to be their starting point, but that may be where they are after they interview the witnesses and, and have a hearing. Chris, that, that was an excellent breakdown. I want to drill down on a little of the nuances, and you're from that area, so you have a better feel uh, for it, but I, I was going to read, and, and I think our audience needs to know this, in the moving papers, I presume the law is correct, it sounds pretty, pretty much like they are throughout the rest of the country, if the defendant proves the alleged contacts occurred, the prosecution bears the burden to show they were harmless. So the prosecutor has to show that they were harmless and in, it goes on to further state and they're, they're citing a case uh, Ramir where it says in a criminal case any private communication contact tampering directly or indirectly with a juror D is deemed is deemed presumptively prejudicial it's so by operation of law it's not a question it's deemed presumptively operational and the burden rests heavily upon the government to establish after notice and hearing to the defendant that such contact with the jurors was 
harmless to the defendant. And then it goes on to say the presumption is even stronger where the contact is made by a court official and that a new trial must be granted unless it clearly appears, listen to this language, Chris, that the subject matter of the communication was harmless and could not have affected the verdict. You're down in that area. Like you said, this presumption kind of goes opposite of what we normally hear. This is very anti uh, not to say anti-prosecutor, it's very strong language to the due process rights of a defendant. And I'd like you to amplify a little bit more. You know the territory. I think if I were a prosecutor and if this, these allegations were proven, I would just consent to the mistrial and to retry the case. That they certainly will. I'll tell you my experience, whether it's DNA exonerations or others, uh, advocates are dug into their position initially. And, and they've spent thousands of hours on this case and they're going to want I think their starting point will be to try to disprove the assertions made today by the defense team for Mr. Murdoch. But over time, if they cannot disprove it and the presumption does apply, you may very well be right, Bob. They may concede that he's entitled to a new trial through, and they would go out of their way to say through no fault of their own or any of their witnesses but a matter outside of their control that would have undermined the right to a fair trial. Heart heartbreaking. I, I had a murder case where it, it's not anything like this. It was just a juror may have been influenced by somebody, and we had to have all the jurors sit down. And I, I just felt so bad for the family, felt bad about the conviction. But you got to do it. Otherwise, it may get reversed on appeal. So the court's got to make a record on the trial level. And it's just you hate to be in that position. And Jeanette, what does the community think about this? That's a good question, Bob. It's a small community. Uh, they were inundated with press, with media like Gigi and I. Chris Adams uh, made his way down to Walterboro many times. Walterboro, where the trial was actually held, has about 5,400 people. That's the population there. Uh, so it would be really interesting to know what the community has to say about it. I do want to let you know, Bob, though, that I have reached out to the Attorney General's office, uh, Alan Wilson's office, for comment. I'm waiting to see if they get back to me. I, I sent out an email a little bit ago. Also, we had heard some talk about a possible ethics complaint being filed against Becky Hill. And the ethics uh, board got back to me today, and I want to kind of let you know what they said. Uh, and the direct quote was, the State Ethics Commission can neither confirm nor deny the existence of a complaint. So there you have it. We don't have any confirmation that a complaint was filed. Uh, but I was also hearing um, from some people who are more familiar with this process than I am that if probable cause is found in a complaint, should one be filed, then it can become public. So mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to run down that information uh, that I heard over the weekend about a possible ethics complaint being filed as well. So um, that, that would be a very big deal. So we're awaiting word from the attorney general's office to see if they're going to comment or not. And I'm checking my email right now. And so far, I have not heard back. Gigi, uh Again, small community here. What I found interesting is that when the lawyers were talking about how this all developed, they used the term that they couldn't get anywhere. It was like a vortex or a hole, uh, I, I believe may have been one of the terms they had used. But it was when a cone of silence, that's what he said. It was when the clerk wrote a book that caused the jurors to be upset, and if, if I'm, what you can infer from what he's saying, came forward with this information. So how do you perceive, I would imagine most of the people there are kind of anti-Murdoch, uh, the community in general, um, but yeah, you have those jurors who were upset with the clerk. How do you think the community reacts to what they're hearing now if, it is to, if this defense motion is to be believed? I think this community is probably hoping this is moved somewhere else. I mean, we talked to locals the entire six weeks we were there. The stronghold the Murdoch's had on that area was still very evident when we were there. Nobody wanted to go on camera publicly that lived there. So I'm sure there's a bit of panic that the circus may be coming back to town if all this happens and we get a new trial. But I can guarantee you right now, they're probably not going to talk to the press because they seem to shy away from speaking out against Murdaugh when we were there and even after verdict, after he was found guilty and we knew he would be going away, people did not want to talk. So I'm sure that community right now is full of gossip and and talking. I can just imagine it. I spent several months in Walterboro independently years ago. 
it is very much a small town and everybody knows everybody's business so this is all the rage today at the beauty shops and the place where you get your oil changed i'm sure it's being talked about nonstop. well clearly i'd be getting my oil changed not in the beauty shop uh it is what it is. But I know you two are going to love being going back down there if it's, if it's going to be retried and retried. I think it'll be. Chris, I'm going to give you the last question here. Um, I, tell me about your state criminal laws in this regard. The prosecutor mind in me is kind of kicking in right now, and I'm thinking about all this. And if I were a prosecutor or a law enforcement officer, now, of course, they want the feds involved because they don't trust SLED because they are intimately involved in the investigation. But if I were, you know, ear on the wall listening and watching, and I heard that this actually did occur, I'd want to know what training and background and experiences the court clerks get with regard to what they're to do and not to do, and I'm pretty confident there is training there. You can tell me that question number one. Uh, down there, would a clerk know not to do this? You're, you're the resident expert. And if the answer to those two questions is it was done and that they knew that this wasn't right, do you guys have an official misconduct law or a public corruption law, which could be very serious in certain states like our state, where if you violate a rule or regulation or a law based on your official capacity, you can get a very severe criminal sentence for that. Thoughts? Um, they do have training, and I think clerks know not to speak. And, and to respond to Gigi's comments earlier, somebody from a small town in the South, uh, the, the court officials are oftentimes people with great discretion who never violate anyone's confidences. And they're, that's one of the reasons they're so looked up to in the communities that they serve. Uh, in the letter from the defense team to the U.S. Attorney's Office asking for a federal investigation, they cited to a federal code of, of a civil rights violation against Mr. Murdoch, which might get some chuckles in some quarters, but that was their hook to try to get it federally. It's interesting because the feds are also prosecuting Mr. Murdoch, so it's not as if um, as if they don't have some sort of of emotional tie toward viewing him as a criminal, but SLED certainly uh, pursued and took the lead in the homicide cases that in Walterboro. So I thought it was an interesting call. There doesn't really have to be any investigation at this point. There could be a remand and there could be depositions of all 12 jurors. There could be a, a court hearing whatever. Uh, Ms. Hill does need to lawyer up, though. That's critically if, important if, for If her. proven, just real quick, I, I, I'm on a short time for If proven, do you have an official misconduct statute in your state where if you are in performing your duties and you violate your oath with respect to them, that you can be charged? We call it official misconduct, in, at least in our state. That carries a 10-year sentence with five years of parole ineligibility before you even consider for parole. Do you have a corresponding statute there? And if so, what? I believe that we do. I'm not 100 percent sure on that. Bob, that's something I'll look up this afternoon. Yeah, I, I, I would bet. I would bet. I'll tell you what, I, I think she's in serious trouble here, but we will wait and see. Uh, Anjanette Gigi, thank guys, thanks very much as always for the great work that you bring to the table. Chris, for giving us that personal perspective out there in South Carolina. Uh, these are amazing developments. I really appreciate your commentary. I'm really glad I was here today because this was a case that was very interesting to me and as a trial lawyer, having been in this situation as a prosecutor, again, not factually the same, but uh, somewhat with regard to having your conviction in jeopardy. It is a gut-wrenching thing. We'll have more on the Law and Crime Network on this, you can be sure. That's it for us today. Please stay tuned for our regularly scheduled program. Be well.